Today is the first Sunday in Lent. Last week we considered conversion, that is a complete change of habits and morals. So now we have converted and resolved to give up sin. We are now fit to enter purgatory. We must now follow the painstaking purgation of our souls to remove all of the roots of sin. Conversion happens rather rapidly. The actual moment of decision is just that, a moment. In fact, a whole conversion will be effected in a moment, as it was with St. Mary Magdalene. With most of us, though, the conversion takes a short time and is followed by some clean-up work to complete this first step on the road to heaven. But by no means by our conversion have we completed the journey. We have just begun. From our examination of conscience, we know what work needs to be done. Now is the time to pick up the spiritual books, such as The Prodigal Son by Venerable Louis of Granada. Most spiritual books assume that the work of conversion has already been completed, and that we are ready to move forward into the purgative state of the spiritual life. So remember, we must be first converted before the spiritual books can be of a great deal of assistance to us. Before then, all they can do is tell us we need to convert. They can give us that wake-up call. But we must do the conversion. We are now fit for purgatory. And as reasonable people, we want to complete our purgatory right here on earth. Why put off to tomorrow what we can and should do today? And we have a choice. <clears throat> we can purge ourselves here, or we can leave this for the next life. And there are two problems with leaving our purgation to the next life. First of all, by leaving the roots of sin in our soul, which is what we're doing by not purging them out, we are far more likely to commit a mortal sin, especially in that fateful last hour of life. These roots are like a poison that are slowly weakening the soul, which is why they must be dug out, rooted out. The second problem is that it is a million times easier to pull these roots out now than to have them removed by fire and purgatory. Imagine cutting down an oak tree, and now you want to get rid of all the roots in the ground by building a fire on top of the stump, on top of the ground. Consider a mighty oak tree spans 50, 60 feet into the air, and scientists tell us that the roots go 50, 60 feet down into the ground the other direction. And you're trying to burn those roots out with a fire on top, trying to burn down 60 feet into the ground. Imagine how difficult that is. That is how difficult it is to remove the roots of sin by fire and purgatory. That's why the pains of purgatory are so awesome, so terrifying. That's why the fire is so hot, because it has a great job to do. Now, what we're dealing with here is a little sapling of an oak tree. We can take our digger and dig that root out here quite easily. So let us do the job here and now. Let us enter the purgative way of life. Now we must begin a life of serious prayer. Until now we may have prayed, and these prayers have earned us that wake-up call which caused us to convert. But now it is time to really get serious about prayer. <clears throat> we must learn how to pray from the heart, and this is why we take up the holy practice of meditation. Read the spiritual books on meditation. We need to take up meditation and spiritual reading. And in fact, many saints began with, and it's a good idea for us, with what is called meditative reading. We take these spiritual books and slowly read over them and take in those spiritual goodness, these spiritual ideas, in order to bring ourselves closer to Almighty God. And we will take serious effort in this. Study this important part of the science of the saints, and we have a lot to meditate on. Although we must spend a considerable amount of time meditating on how to overcome our vices and implant the contrary virtues, we must spend a good deal of time loving Almighty God. And let us never forget, God is love. It is because God loves us that we are now embarking on the road to heaven. If God did not love us, he would have left us on the road to hell. We were on prior to our conversion. And yes, we were on the road to hell. 
We are beginning a new life, and this life will be different from the lukewarm life we have been leading in the past. We must become on fire with the love of Almighty God, and this fire will burn away our vices. Penance and mortification are essential part of the road to heaven. Even the good thief did penance. Consider that he was promised paradise, yet he still suffered on his own cross for several hours before he died. He died after our Lord Jesus Christ. So he had the promise, which was given here, then several hours of excruciating suffering on the cross, and then finally his death, probably after his legs were broken. So even the good thief did penance. We all look at the miraculous conversion. It was instantaneous. He was promised paradise, and yet he did penance. Like Mary Magdalene, we are penitents. And penitents do penance to atone for their multitude of sins. We must bring forth fruits worthy of penance. The works of penance and mortification are usually the same. However, they are undertaken for different reasons. We do penance to atone for our past sins. And we do um, mortify ourselves in order to prevent future sins. And yes, we must prevent future sins. Yes, I may be converted. But there is still a danger I can turn back. I can go the wrong way. And let us never forget, we are sinners. We need to look at the seven deadly sins, for these are our downfall. And the spiritual books are there to help us in our batter. Consider the spiritual combat by Scupoli. It's an excellent work, and there are many other excellent books. We would like to focus on a few things here and expand on what is in the books, because there's no way in a sermon I can cover everything, because each one of us has different faults, different weaknesses. And that's why we spend our time in spiritual reading and meditation, so we can seek out the remedies we need. First of all, there is a strong temptation to pride, and this temptation to pride is even stronger today for many of us. God has led us away from the many errors of today and into his remnant, and I am so proud of that. And this is dangerous, and indeed can leave us, lead us right back outside of the church. True, God has blessed us immensely. In the Gospels we read, And unto whomsoever much is given, of him much shall be required, and to whom they have committed much, of him they will demand the more. God has given you these blessings, expecting you to bring forth much fruit. And if we look back at our sinful lives, this should be enough to trample down any temptation to pride. We must trample it down. It's got to go. Yes, God has given me much, and how have I repaid him? I have sinned. I have been unfaithful. Much has been given me, and instead of returning much or even little, I've returned the opposite. It's like someone giving us a great big gift of a million dollars, and I turn around and slap him in the face. That is what we've done with God. If we think about this, this should keep us humble. How ungrateful is that? Let us keep constantly before our mind what manner of man we truly are. Any good comes from God, who works through us as his tools. We let ourselves be as a hammer or a screwdriver in God's hands, for him to use as he wills. Then we're getting smart. Many focus on lust, and indeed the Blessed Virgin Mary was right, when she prophesied that the air will be filled with the spirit of impurity, so many years ago at Quito, Ecuador. How do you think that impurity makes it into your television, radio, or computer? Impurity is literally beaming down on us from 22,000 miles in the sky, day and night. All we need is a little antenna and another piece of equipment to tap into the steady stream of filth. With lust, it is simple. Put that thought out of your mind. Covetous 
anger, and envy flow from not having what others have, thinking that it is owed to us. Let us consider what we are owed for our sins. Let us thank God that he will forgive us and not pay us what we truly deserve. By anger and envy, we make ourselves our own little gods, which is what the world tells us to do. Sloth flows from an easy way of life. We have all of these labor-saving devices. A prudent person uses them to free up more time for other duties and to expand the time of prayer. But how many can cook a meal in 30 minutes and then find three hours to waste in the afternoon in front of the computer or television? They would be better off spending three and a half hours cooking in the kitchen as our ancestors did. So let us consider all of this technology is a great gift from God, but he gave it to us for a reason, to give us more time for him, more time for prayer, more time to do other good things. Today the world is designed for sloth, and many of us have fallen into slothfulness. Indeed, we can take a look at the lives of some of the slothful today. What they can get away with today, they could not have gotten away with 50 years ago, and especially not a century ago. It was simply impossible for, because the demands of life were such larger that this type of slothfulness was reserved to a very few. True, a century ago and two centuries ago, preachers preached against sloth and there were slothful people. But compared to them, we make them look industrious. That's how slothful we can be today. This is why we strongly recommend a solid hour a day in prayer. A solid hour a day in prayer to keep ourselves focused, to keep our minds on one thing important as St. Mary Magdalene did. How many hours of pray do you, prayer do you think St. Mary Magdalene spent? It's a good question. This hour of day in prayer will help us keep our life in order and in fact to get it straightened out in the first place. Next week we will consider gluttony, which is an extremely large problem today. And then the week after we will discuss what I call the eighth deadly sin, curiosity. Curiosity killed the cat and it kills the soul. Let us begin now on the purgative way of life. Let us begin purging ourselves of all worldliness, because we must remove the worldliness so God can fill it with heavenliness, so that God himself can move in and make a, an abode in our souls, that God can truly dwell within us in sanctifying grace. There is no place for worldliness and God in the same soul. One will push the other out eventually. Worldliness will push out God, or with God's help, we will push out worldliness and God will move in to replace it. So, it is time now that we have converted. We have changed our morals and habits. We have made that resolution to give up sin, to carry that resolution forward, to do the work that needs to be done to become saints. Because no one is called to become mediocre. We are all called to become saints. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.